Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Well, good morning, Known Victory Church. So excited that you're joining us today. And my name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here at our church, and it's an honor that you're here with us. And as you can tell, I'm actually not here in person this morning. I am currently at our outreach church in Calgary, Eastside Victory Church. And, and I'm uh, spending our, uh, my morning here and my morning uh, spending time with Pastor Brian and Tina Bork, our pastors of our outreach in Calgary. And so uh, today, you know, I'm so uh, grateful for technology because I have the opportunity right now to be speaking in two different churches uh, at the exact same time. And so uh, it's just, just an honor that you're here with us. But, you know, we've been working through a series as a church uh, called Questions God Asks Us. And we're going through some of the most important questions that God asked His people in scripture and what that means for us. And I believe that all, all these questions God is still asking today, that these questions can bring so much clarity or so much uh, hope or faith and even just build things up inside of us if we realize that God is asking us the same question and he's still asking them today. And so today I want to go through our next question. And the next question that I have is this question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? It's such a unique question, this question, what are you doing here? And it's a question that God asked the prophet Elijah. And this question comes at a very fascinating or interesting time for Elijah. As he's just challenged, Elijah just challenged the prophets of Baal to a competition. You know, he's to this competition and whoever wins uh, will prove whose God is superior, which God is better, which God is stronger. And so what the challenge is or the competition, what they do is they set up altars, one towards God and one to towards Baal. And their mission is to call down fire from heaven and see which one of the altars will get burned, which God will burn the altar. And so the, all, the, the prophets of Baal, they come and they try and, you know, call down fire from heaven. They try and call down this fire that, that Baal would, would light their altar. And to their dismay, it's silence. Uh, their God is not speaking. It is silence. And, and they're calling and all of a sudden Elijah's like, hey, he starts mocking them. It says, he starts mocking them. Maybe your God's sleeping. You know, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's away. Maybe he's just not present. And he starts mocking them. And after this, he, he tells them, hey, let's pour water on my altar. And there's one thing you know about fire is that water uh, doesn't really help with fire. It actually puts it out. And so he says, says, hey, let's douse my altar with water and let's see what happens. Buckets and buckets and liters and liters of water. And he, he calls down fire and immediately fire comes up and consumes the entire altar. Water included, it gulps it up. In seconds, it's gone. He has won this thing and it has proved the power of God. And this is exactly what it says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38. It says, Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when he, all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, He is good. Yes, the Lord is God. Proven and powerful. An incredible miracle, this incredible spectacle of God. One that I think would turn even the hardest of hearts towards God. One that if it was, if it was me who called down the fire, it would end up being on, my website, on our website, in our bio. Or it would have been in our, my Instagram account in my bio, right, he would say, you know, husband and father of Jesus and, 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 and father and pastor and miracle worker, fire caller. I would want the world to know this miracle that I had seen. But this actually isn't the only 
spec spectacle or the the not only the this the 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 only spectacular miracle that Elijah sees before God asks him this question. And if we can see in the end of chapter 18, we see this. Finally, the seventh time the servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky went black with clouds and a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm. And Ahab quickly left for Jezreel. And the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. See, this, this moment where, where Elijah outruns chariots, that Elijah was either a world record holder, marathon runner, or this was a miracle. He would have won gold medal for outrunning a chariot at the pace that he was setting. God gave him the strength to outrun a chariot. See, Elijah sees two incredible miracles not including God's provision of rain from a drought, but he sees fire come from heaven and he's also given the ability to outrun a chariot and not grow tired. See, Elijah has seen so many miraculous things in his time as a prophet so far, a pretty good track record. It would leave me pretty confident that I was untouchable, right? It would leave me pretty confident that no matter what came after me, I would be confident that I would be okay. If I'd seen these miracles, I would be very confident. But if we continue the story, this is not at all what's going on in Elijah's mind. And continue the story as we prepare for this question in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And then verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Then he, then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. This is the moment that Elijah's confidence has left him. He goes from outrunning chariots. He goes from fire falling from heaven to himself hiding under a tree alone, asking to die and wanting to die. What happened? How did he go from the mountaintop to the valley so quickly? But I think we as humans, we understand how easy it can be to go from the miraculous or go from the mountaintop to the valley. It can happen extremely quickly. We go from the high of the mountain to the low of the valley? How did he go from a prophet to broken, from a miracle worker to distraught? He was so scared for his life, he ran away, and he really just wanted it to be over. He had lost everything. It seemed like to him in this moment, it seemed that he had lost everything. He had ran away, ran away from his mission, ran away from his calling, and ran towards his fears and insecurities rather than run towards God, which tends to be what we do. We tend to, when we're on the mountain, we, 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 we tend to become even more insecure sometimes. We think it will build confidence, but then our fear goes, what if, what if this is a one-off? Or what if this doesn't happen again? Or what if I don't want to lose this moment? And we get so caught up in our insecurity and fear that it tends, we tend to slide back down the mountain pretty quickly. And then in verse 5, it says this, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more for the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. 
in the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. And then this is the part, this is where this question comes. It says this, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is the question that comes up. What are you doing here? Or maybe another way to ask it would be, how did you get here, right? Why are you here? How did you get to this desolate place? And it's a question that God asks. Again, he, 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 he knows the answer. And it doesn't come from a place of judgment, but from a place of love. Why are you here? See, you're better than this. You're bigger than this. You're stronger this, than this. I even think God is saying when he asks us this question, or even asks Elijah this question, what are you doing here? I think he's saying, I'm bigger than this. I'm better than this. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared because I am with you. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because I am with you. I am stronger. I am bigger than anything you face. Did you not see the miracles? I think this is the same question God might be asking you and asking me. What are you doing here? It might not be a physical place like Mount Sinai. It might not be a desolate place physically. But how did we get to this place? How did we get to this place in our own mind? And how did we get to this place in our own hearts, in our own souls, this desolate place? He he goes from calling down fire from heaven and outrunning chariots to hiding under a tree and hiding in a cave wishing he was dead. You might look at your own journey. You might look at your own story and you might see all the small steps you took to get where you are. The small steps you've taken in your career and the small steps you've taken in your family and the small steps you've taken in your relationships. That we don't get to where we are in our minds, in our souls, in our spirit. We don't get to where we are physically in a moment, it often happens one small step at a time. So the question is, where do you find yourself right now? Where are you? Are you content and are you happy with your life? Are you happy with where you are? Or do you find yourself in a similar spot to Elijah? A place where your mental health is bad and Your confidence is low and your fear is high and maybe even your will to live is zero. Where do you find yourself? What small steps have you taken? See, the small steps in a moment, they might not seem like a big deal. They might just seem small and insignificant, but every single step we take leads us to where we are. Where are you and what? Are you doing here? So God is asking Elijah this question. What are you doing here? This isn't where you're supposed to be. This isn't what I called you to do. This isn't what it's where you're supposed to be. Why are you here? And Elijah answers this question kind of whining like we tend to do with God. He says, why are you here? Why are you struggling? And we're like, well, God, let me tell you about all the things going on in my life. Have you not been paying attention? Maybe you've been out on vacation not seeing what's going on in my life. Maybe you're not seeing the pain and not seeing the fear in my life. And this is what Elijah says as he whines to God. He says this, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. That's what's going on. Have you not been paying attention? Here I am. I don't even want to be here anymore. Are you listening? God answers him and says this, Go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose and the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his faith in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said again, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
He replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down the, your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram, and anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. The reality is that where Elijah was wasn't where he was supposed to be. It wasn't where he was supposed to be mentally. It wasn't where he was supposed to be physically. It wasn't where he was supposed to be spiritually. See, Elijah had seen the miracles. And I think all of us, maybe you've seen God move. You've seen, you've seen provision. You've seen blessing. You've seen healing. You've seen miracles. You've seen your own life change. You've seen all the glory and splendor and beauty of who God is. But inside of us, we still feel broken and lost. We still feel so alone. We, we've led ourselves into isolation and led ourselves into broken places that we're not where we're supposed to be. And I think sometimes when we look inwards, we can sometimes see, hey, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. But oftentimes we're where we are and we don't even realize the problems that we're facing. We don't even realize the space that we found ourselves. And God comes in and says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? See, this question gets asked twice in this story. What are you doing here? And God responds two different ways to the same response Elijah gives. It shows the two things we need when we look around and we realize we aren't where we're supposed to be. And when we realize all the little steps we took to get there. Number one is we need to realize God isn't just in the spectacular. He isn't just in the noise and the splendor. He isn't just in this, the, the miracles and the supernatural. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the waves. He, he wasn't in this, the grand things. The God was in the quiet as well. See, Elijah, again, he'd seen the miracles. He'd seen fire come down. He'd outran chariots. He'd call down rain, yet something was missing. Something st was still missing. What I think was missing for him was this intimacy with God and the peace that being in close proximity to God to hear a whisper can be. The strength a whisper can bring. The strength hearing his voice in the quiet can be. It seems to me that as we go through all of these questions, as we go through this question, as we go through the ones we've already gone through, that God has asked in Scripture, the design of them is to draw us back in. The design of them is to create space where we can be intimate again. The, the design is for us to have realizations or revelations of what we're actually doing and where we're supposed to be. These questions designed to get us back on track. I think some of these questions are the most important questions that have been asked to us as people. And we go to this one. What are you doing here? I think he's saying you can't run away because I will find you. He's saying we need him to be strong. See, God sent an angel to give him strength, to give him food and give him water, the holy heavenly carbs that came from heaven to give him enough energy for a 40-day journey. This is probably some of the best meal we could ever eat. See, the strength that God brings us is stronger than anything else we have access to. This meal, this food, this, 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 this building up that he was given in this moment strengthened him for a 40-day journey. I think some of us, we need to start to taste and see that the Lord is good to actually, to actually see him and, and to experience him and go back to the intimacy that we were created for with God. We've gotten so busy or so caught up in our problems 
that we forget to be intimate and we forget to spend time in scripture and we forget to know who God is. We need to know who he is. And when he asks us the question, why are you here? I think it's designed for us to realize how much we need him. That no matter what obstacles come, no matter the mountains in front of us, no matter the giants we see, no matter the circumstances that we see happening around us, we can be confident and strong because we know who we serve and we serve the creator of the universe. See, God, even if we're not where we're supposed to be, God will find us and bring us back to the right place. He'll bring us back to the correct spot every single time. So that's it. Number one, we need to realize that God isn't just in the spectacular, but he's also in the quiet and in the whisper. Elijah saw the miracles, but he needed intimacy. He needed the intimacy and the, and the strength that, that comes from intimacy to actually step into more of who it was. And then number two is this. We need each other. We need each other. Now I talk about us needing community and I talk about us needing accountability and I talk about us needing each other a lot because it's so true. Yeah, I think it's one of the things we struggle with the most as humans. The first thing God does the second time God asks the question is, is he sends Elijah to find community to find someone to disciple and to find someone to work with and someone to do life with. See, as we remember with Adam and Eve, we were never created to do life alone. See, God saw this and created other people for us to do life with. We need community and we need each other. It's not just a want, it's a need inside of us that we need one another. So what does community do? Community does so many things. We're not going to go through all the intricacies of what community does, but I think two of the most important things that community does for us as individuals, uh, number one is accountability. See, community builds accountability because we have other people we need to be accountable to. If we say we're going to do something, they can hold us accountable to actually do it. They can actually help hold us accountable for what we do and for what we say and bring correction when needed. People can help us become the best version of ourselves by pushing us to be better. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy when we need correction or we need accountability, but each and every one of us, if we want to be strong, if we want to keep on going, if we want to keep on fighting, we need accountability. We need somebody to be there when we're, when, when we're doing or saying the right things or when we're saying and doing the wrong things to help us and correct us and coach us to be the best version of ourselves. And number two, what do we need is support. When we are in community, we can support each other. We can be there for each other in the best moments and be there for each other in the hardest moments. We can ask for help when we need it and offer help when they need it. If we're struggling, they can come and help us meet our needs. You know, in the Bible, it talks about how if we see someone hungry, we got to give them food. If we see someone thirsty, we can give them something to drink. If we see someone naked, we can give them something to wear. That's not going to happen when we're alone. See, Elijah, he's found himself isolated. He's left his servant and he's gone to the mountain and he's gone and he says, I want to die. He's alone. We were never created to be alone. And we have to understand the truth and depth of this, that we need one another. Community helps us grow into the people God created us to be. We need to be accountable to one another and support each other through life's hardest and most difficult moments. See, when God asks the question, what are you doing here? It does many things. It gets us thinking about the journey we've been on, the small steps it took for us to get where we are, that even though we've seen the miraculous, even though we've seen the beauty, even though we've seen it all, that something is still missing. 
something is still missing and then we find ourselves one day where our mental health is horrible or physically we're not doing well or our spiritual health is low we're not praying anymore we're not reading the scriptures anymore we're not spending time with Jesus anymore and we wonder why we're struggling this question opens our eyes to see our struggle it opens our eyes to understand the struggle that we are going through it opens our eyes. It allows us to see how we got to where we are physically, spiritually, and mentally. And it allows us to see the things we need to do in order to get back on track. This question draws us out of the darkness and into the light. It allows us to make our way back to the narrow road and bring us back to understanding that God is speaking and we need to be listening. So when we go to this question, what are you doing here? What do we need to do? We need to actually sit back and think about how did I get to where I am? Am I content? Am I happy with where I am? Am I content with where my anger is? Am I content with where my patience is? Am I content with my mental health? Am I happy with how I'm doing? And I think for a lot of us, we answer that question, we're not content. We know that God has get, uh, came to give us life and give it to the full, yet we look at our lives and we feel like we're just filled with lack. We feel like, God, like, where are you? And he's saying, huh, what are you doing here? This isn't where you're supposed to be. Yes, I'll come find you. I'll meet you in the valley. I'll meet you in the brokenness. I'll meet you there. But I'm not staying here. He said the Lord was about to pass by. See, God isn't going to sit with you over uh, every single minute of every single day in your brokenness. He's saying, I'm going somewhere. I'm not going to sit here and, and just be here forever. I, we need to go somewhere. What are you doing here? You know, our takeaway today, again, is so simple. What are you doing here? I think this week we need to actually come to a place where we actually think about this. What am I doing here? And maybe not just what am I doing here, but how did I get here? How did I get to a place where my spiritual life is in shambles? How did I get to a place where my mental health is so horrible? Am I, is there things in my life, addictions or struggles that I'm working through that are in the darkness that need to come to the light? Or are there things that we're going through that we need to, to, to allow other people into? See, when we ask this question, it does so much for us. But God answers that question when Elijah complains. He answers it two times. He says, hey, I'll meet you in the quiet. I'll give you the strength. And then go and find community. Go and find somebody in and if you're, if you're watching today, if you're listening today and you need somebody to talk to, come talk to us. Like We would love to be there and support you and help you. We want to be a community. We want to be able to be there for one another. That's one of our biggest uh, visions for our church is to be a place that anyone can call home. And what that means is that we actually have to create an environment that we can feel like we're at home, where we can be there for each other and support each other and learn from each other and help each other and be accountable to each other. What are you doing here? I think it's a fascinating question that I would encourage you to go through. Wherever you find yourself, whether you're finding yourself in the valley or you're finding yourself on the mountain, God is asking the same question. What are you doing here? Why are you here? And if where you are isn't where you're supposed to be, it may be time to start making some steps and taking some steps back in the right direction. See, God gave him the journey. Go back the way that you came and go find Elisha and make him, then disciple him and train him up because he's going to take the mantle from you. What are you doing here? You know, I want to pray for us today and I, I want to encourage you to go through this question to, to maybe spend some time thinking about it. What am I doing here? Am I happy? Am I content? Am I where I'm supposed to be? Or am I kind of off track and I need to make my way back to the right path? So Father, we thank you today that you are here with us in this room. God, we thank you that you are so amazing, that you're so beautiful. And God, as you ask us this question, what am I doing here? God, I pray you give us courage. You help us understand. You help us learn. 
and you help us answer this question, what am I doing here? And God, I thank you that if we're not where we're supposed to be, I thank you that you'll meet us where we are, but that you'll guide us and take us back to the road and to the place that we are supposed to be. In Jesus' name.